It is November 19th, 2003, approximately 10.30 in the morning. We're in the Atlanta History Center. And today we are interviewing Mr. Wallace Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin, if you will uh, d identify yourself for the record and tell us a little bit about where you were born and that sort of thing, we can get our interview started. My name is Wallace Baldwin, Jr. I was born in Hawthorne, Florida. I'm the only child. The mother had a large family, so I wasn't really lonesome in the process. I was 13 of them. In fact, I'm older than most of my brothers and sisters. I go back to the third generation of the family. Uh, from there, I just the normal schools and uh, mother was a teacher, so after the second grade. Why don't you tell us the names of your parents? <clears throat> Wallace and Elma M. Morris, Sr. And, uh, parents. and I basically grew up in and around Hawthorne, but the fact that my mother was a teacher, and at that time, they allowed persons to teach in out of high school, so I had to travel around where she was finishing up her education. So we had an opportunity at one point to go to the same school on that one in the morning and she went in the afternoon. Uh, Where was this? This was in Palatka, Florida, which was within the same general geographic area of Florida. And I think uh, the only class I had uh, was my mother teaching me was in the third one and I saw, sort of swore that would, that would be the last one because <laughs> I was always an example. Okay, fine. So uh, tell us about high school. And, uh, well, after grade school, I went to a private missionary school in, at, known as Fesson Academy. It was outside of Oak, north of Ocala, Florida, near Silver Springs. You may be familiar with that area. And I finished high school there. And it, in in it military was, service? No. I was, I was 17 years old, I came to Atlanta. Uh, well, uh, during the summer after high school, I was at this the, is just after World War II. Right. In high school, uh, right after high school, I had a scholarship to Florida uh, A&M and track, but some of my parents decided that that may not be the place for me, and given the fact that you know a lot of people, you know, first thing, I didn't know, maybe I wouldn't study. Anyway, I came into Morehouse and arrived in Morehouse and I uh, was a freshman at Morehouse first year. And after that, I sort of worked around in jobs. The second year, I was in school. It came necessary for me to do basically to work, so I sort of dropped out and went back home, worked during the summer, and came back to college again. And by the time I got settled down, and you know, the usual expression, you get your head screwed on, right? I was drafted in the military. What year was that now? That was 1951. 1951. Yeah. So uh, then you, where did you, where were you inducted? In well, uh, I was, in, actually, I had to go back to Florida, but I, uh, they transferred the papers here somehow. I got, went, left Atlanta. And then I left Atlanta, went to Fort Gordon. Well, it wasn't Fort Gordon, it was Camp Gordon. And um, I attempted to get in there. I went to go in the medical field. So at the time, the, given the, I'd been reading about the situation in Korea. And uh, when I got to Fort Gordon, they said we didn't, they didn't need a psychiatric social work, because that was what I was thinking about majoring in, you know. And that's part of the reason I came to Morehouse with the School of Social Work that they had at that particular time. Um, so I wound up and I guess it came from some of my high school experience, uh, did it out kind of stuff and playing around too. I wound up as a field radio repairman. And that was uh, after basic training, of course. How tough was basic training? It was pretty tough because it was a known fact at the time the way the war was going that uh, everyone basically would wind up. And that's what was, you know, basically what was happening. You had only one place to go once you finished basic training. In some instances, you didn't even get uh, a trade, you know, a specialty. You, you got it over there. And that's what I guess I was one of the lucky ones because most of the persons that started off with me, most of them uh, took some shorter trades. Maybe they were in different areas, and so uh, most of them went to Korea, and unfortunately, most of them were killed, too. 
But, you know, I guess you've heard about the statistics of that war in comparison to the short war where a lot of people were hurt. Let me, let me ask you, so you, you took the training. Where did you take the training? At, at Camp Gordon. At Camp Gordon. And, and how long did that last? Well, it was about eight weeks, and, uh, you know, night and day kind of thing. They're getting ready to go. And I used to, just had to go night and day in the classroom work. You'd come out in the morning, you rest a little, and you go back at night because they were really trying to push to get signal code. I'd try to establish uh, uh, communications and, and to give them the terrain and so forth. So we spent a lot of time on studying the terrain and the difficulty, uh, you know, they had over there fighting and some of the uh, I guess bleeding upon the experience of the of the persons who were in active army, particularly the 187th Airborne, most of them jumped and they were killed. They brought them over from Europe, and uh, we were getting you know all those kind of reports how difficult it would be. And given that we did not have the, the normal infantry training, and it became a fact if we were supposed to set up communications so they can come, we would be you know sort of with them. You had them almost know as much as an infantryman in order to succeed or in life. So during, during that period of time, I sort of changed course. I said, well, I'd noticed the, and I had a little bit in high school, a little did it did out kind of stuff, you know, code kind of stuff involved. They call it cryptography. So I volunteered for cryptography, so that sort of caused the delay in my really going with the group that I came in with. And by the time that they had uh, did the background check all the way back to you, uh, I think four years old. <laughs> and, <laughs> this is, I mean, they really went back, and some people thought I was in trouble because where they went to get, get information back down trick in order to get the top, top secret clearance to, to be in that area. So uh, you did have top secret. Yes, eventually, and so. What happened to cryptography? I sort of got bored, you know, waiting in the time, so I saw an opportunity so long until I went to, uh, with the electronic background, which I got in there, I went to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, Houston. That was the ordinance, it was ordinance there. And that took a short course there, and ultimately I wound up being a, a, <coughs> a fire control, what they call the ordinance fire control technician. Yeah. What, what, what now, the fact fire control technician, it wasn't necessarily what it means in terms of fire. That it had, the artillery had certain weapons and guns that they used, which would, uh, you know, basically fire planes and knock them out of the air. We were technicians that would support their mission. So there, we went through the radar sets and things that are going to be used. They floated them in the Potomac River to see where they stand, you know, the well and, you know, things of that nature. And the, and the mean, in the meantime, we were uh, basic, wasn't observers, but if something happened to the equipment, we would be responsible for keeping on the, on the air because in Washington, you couldn't be off the air. Uh, they allowed you, the window probably was about four hours, and then you had to really report that there was a, there was a weakness in the, in, in the, in the setup. How long were you at, in, in Maryland? In Maryland, I guess I was there maybe four months or more. I don't remember exactly. And again, a rigorous training. A rigorous training, and at that point, they decided to send me to uh, send me to Japan to do myself. So, what what what's the time frame here? Were, were, are we we're in 1952 yet? No, early part, we were still out of 1952, we were still in 1952, so they decided at the last moment to send me to the Southeastern Signal School, that's what Camp Gordon was over in, in Yomaha, Japan, uh, so I took a fast ride over. How did you get there? The plane. Took a fast ride over and a fast ride back. All of a sudden, I started to set up to go Monday morning. Came on Sunday, to, you know, to teach classes in radio, fuel radio repair, basic things in radio, AC and DC, and the kind of things that they would need. And all of a sudden, I was flown back to the United States. I couldn't really figure out why. I was flown back and I landed in San Francisco, and I was actually assigned to a a artillery group. And what happened was they had made a decision that the training I had in Maryland and the fact that the, the artillery, which is out of Texas, they weren't going to necessarily use that equipment in Korea because of 
because of the, the, the I guess because of the terrain and everything and the kinds of army equipment which was good at the time, it wouldn't be feasible to use it there. And the war was still going on, and I guess decisions were being made whether they used Tommy Brown, whether they used Napalm, you know, subsequently they did in order to burn the enemy out of the mountains and holes of that nature. So what happened was that someone realized that the defense of the United States, like similar to what's going on now, all the troops over there, and then what about the defense over here? And so basically, at all the ports of embarkation where you could get in America, they sent those of us who had the training in addition to some who hadn't training with, the, we were assigned these artillery, quote, party infantry groups. So I was assigned San Francisco at Presidio, and others were assigned in Miami, New York, and, and uh, Seattle, and other areas where possible enemy could come in. And the artillery people were on sites away from, well, in San Francisco, they were away from uh, Presidio, where we were all basically slept in the hospital. They were up in Grizzly Peak, Twin, Twin Mountains, we call it Twin Peaks, uh, going north of San Francisco, south San Mateo. They had weapons in and around there, because while I was at Maryland, they did have this, I guess, the pre-runner of your jets, and they had guns on it, you know. The kind of guns that the artillery you would sit on, you know, actually they would sit on some of the faster planes could, if they got under the radar, then, you know, they had the fast guns that you'd torch, you know, around and shoot them. But, Did you uh, train on those guns? No, they showed us all the, you know, about to, you know, with radar and with some of the equipment from our city, so radar vans, and that's what equipment was being furnished. Yeah, yeah be based in the van, w watching that, and we did have some tragic situations that happened by guys not sitting on, not buckling, you know, you get slung off it. But the, the 120s, which was the larger weapons, uh, we had the vans on, on the site, and we had the artillery personnel had limited training. So so when something really happened on the range, we had to get out like ASOP, you know, in regards to where it was in San Francisco, might be having a dinner or whatever the case might be, the MPs immediately come pick you up and escort, you had to escort to the site, and that's the way it was most of the time. Uh, it's a rare instance uh, during that time, you know, you I used to get paid back then, you know, you get paid, you line up. We're the only ones that really got paid by check because of the, and no one really ever knew knew what we were doing because it was in civilian clothes most of the time and we did I guess there's a plus to it to some ex some extent you didn't have we didn't have to worry about inspections and, and all of that kind of we had to stay keep your area but basically uh, we were either in the veins in the vans or if something had gone wrong at one of the sites in and around San Francisco, be getting parts, and some instances, some of us was chosen to c come back to North Carolina where they were building. They actually had to pull parts instead of bench repairing. And our shop, by the way, was right under the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, in, in order not to uh, delay or stay off the air, at the time they had to get parts if they weren't in Pueblo. Colorado, they, they actually go back and get them off the assembly line. That's how critical it was at, at the time. So I had what you, and all of us had what we call critical MOSs and, and subject to the extension. So I was able to stay right there in San Francisco until I was officially discharged in August, and then I had to stay over because of my MOS until somebody came and replaced me. So how long did that take? It took almost 60 days. So you got an extra 60 days right. because they couldn't get someone? Yeah. And they were, well, in fact, they were, I guess if I had taken the job at the time, I discussed with my parents taking a job at the time as doing more or less as a civilian, doing almost the same thing, they would have been uh, opt after some meditation and so forth. And the parents uh, need to come back and, you know, continue education and things like this. Because I'd gotten to know the town of uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area, and I was, I was taking some courses there, too. I wasn't out of time. I took some courses at the University of San Francisco. That's where I first met John, John Mathis. Few people know that. <laughs> He's a track star, I and mean, you know, and they responded to him. And I took some uh, courses in San Francisco. 
uh, from the University of California from Berkeley. They didn't have the bridge in between. You couldn't get over there like you can now. Things have changed considerably. And I came back to Atlanta and and. Let me uh, ask this question. The uh, let's see. Truman integrated the armed forces, I think, in 40, 40, 40, 40, 45, 48. Yeah. yeah. What What was it like? It still must have had some bumps. Well, it had some bumps, not too much during the period that the war was going on. In, in terms of that, but when I was surprised when I got back, and you know, we all had an obligation. To probably 10 years you could be called up because they really didn't know what was going to happen at that time. So you always are on the, on the alert to be called any moment at a time. So you have to tell them where you were. So, so, so when I came back, I said, what did I, I asked, I called, talked with the local reserve group, and I asked them, uh, what could I do actually to get my foul papers, so to speak, you know, get them before the 10 years open. So what happened was in this particular instance, I said, well, what was the MOS, I told them, and explained the kind of do that. So, well, the only thing that we have for you is a truck driver, or a cook. Despite of all your... Despite of the backgrounds and stuff of that nature. And we may not, this may or may not be a paid slot. That's another thing for you at the time. But this had been in the, the reserve. This was in Atlanta, right, in the reserve. So the reserves were still not integrated. Well, not in that, not in, not in Atlanta. They may at some places made yeah, some phases, and it was not in integrated. So I didn't think too much except to it. I was the objective then was to actually get the official that I completed my time wouldn't be obligated to be. Cause all I was proud to, you know, I come to come to the realization after me and then when I was in the Army, I was glad to serve my country and enjoy the experience. And if I had to do it, you know, if they called me, I would, you know, I would have done it again. But I was just, so uh, I went through the process and got assigned, but, uh, uh, not as, as a truck driver, but some pretty close to maintenance, which uh, maintenance of vehicles, which I really didn't. I had maintenance of electronics kind, so that spilled over into my doing what they did that time. And, Point they call second echelon on maintenance. So basically, that was changing oil and, and vehicles and and doing the, just normal things that would maintain the vehicle. Nothing heavy in terms of mechanical. Uh, so it was in, in the and the group here was headed by and it was all segregated in terms of units in the reserve. Uh, Sutton, who was, was uh, Roswell Sutton, whose family is pretty distinguished in Atlanta with the, the associated with the Methodist Church and so forth. So at the time, he was uh, commanding officer of that particular unit. They had another unit which was basically quartermaster, and it was all segregated too. So I guess it's, it's 53, 54, 55, 56, I guess that the point in time, they split up the units that were all segregated, split it up, and we all went different directions. So they integrated in 56? I mean, I'd say that was told. As far as the segregated units, they were abolished and split up. It's, I guess uh, between, I would say between 55 and 50. Uh, 54 and 55, 56, because some were still standing after that. So we split up and three of us, I know two of us were sent to the the uh, Atlanta University of school or staff. I said that again. Where was the school? After this in Atlanta University of school. I think it was in uh, East Point at the time. You remember they had a facility in East Point over there. Off of no Payne Street, or near now, where the uh, this, this, the uh, Center for National Archives is located. Yeah. Remember, my, a few years ago, they had a turbo fire over there. That was the building we used to go to have reserve meetings in. Right at right at, right at that point, I was assigned to the to the staff, and uh, they had very few enlisted classes at the time. As for rank and file person. What was your rank at this point? My rank at that point, I was still corporal. It wasn't any, for the union, I was still a, still a corporal. And, and you had all these skills that you and were not being used. Both college and 
you know, and, 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 and not being you. So when I got in the school staff, they eventually had classes for MOS to realize they needed skills for the particular and another kid. MOS. That's a military occupation, especially at the time. So I went in and started as an assistant instructor, and I guess the first class was in in uh, fact that being an assistant instructor because they're still carrying on the cooks classes and things like that so based as assistant instructor made sure the logistics and order materials and things that they needed from the various points where you got materials for them and eventually uh, along with the other guy, one or two of us got assigned to the school. So Mr. Rucker, you may have read about him a few years ago because he, uh, he was also in the unit with me. And his full name was? Walter Rucker. Okay. Walter Rucker. And he was one of the, some people, you know, have a knack for details and regulations, rules and regulations and things like that, and it just it comes natural to him, you know, and organizing and so forth. So he got to be in the administrative side and I was on the structure side. So eventually after a few years I wound up with a, after the instructor training, which was at Fort McPherson, that's where it was located at the time. Fort McPherson became a MOS instructor. Okay, what you? I think it was about 1958, between 58 and 59, if I recall. And I became an instructor in the school with, with the MOS classes, but during the summer camps, either 21 days or some instance of a month of active duty, the school primary mission was to train officers. It's an officers of school called Army Reserve Officers. So in summer, I became assistant instructor to an officer. An officer, they, they start off with lieutenants, you know, and they go all the way up, and they, they have their they have their training there all the way up to the. Uh, some of them even wind up going to war college, and they have. Who, who was the officer you were attached to? Well, generally, it wasn't in the Pacific, but what, it depends whatever stage they had classes in. So they had the Command General Staff School went in about four series. So it may be assigned to an officer uh, at uh, Command's level one or two as an, as an assistant. So it may not be doing any actual instruction, but making sure that all of the thousands of pieces of materials that they get from Fort Leavenworth was, was actually in place and, and explained to him how to use it as they were, as the instructor was, you know, basically going through the materials. Now, is, now the, the, the reserve is... This is reserve, right. Mm -hmm. so you're instructing uh, classes of both uh, African Americans and whites. And whites. All, it was all... all any all any friction on, on this basis? No, it wasn't, and it's sometimes that some officers said some ideas, but you know, you let stuff roll on and go on, you don't, you know, you don't get, as, as kids would say, you don't get hung up by it. But outside the gates of Fort McPherson or place in East Point, you're, you're still a Jim Crow society. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, so I was going to school and at the particular time working post, so I was too busy to even, you know, basic thing and family going along all that simul simultaneously. Right. Now, tell, tell us, you, you, did you, you, you got married at some point? What, when, when? Well, I got married in uh, 1952, mm -hmm. just as I left for, for and going. And your wife's name is? Ruby K. Baller. And children? I have three. And their names? I'm uh, Gail. Rodney and Michael. Okay, and just give us the dates of birth. Just to well, Gail's 1954, Rodney's 1956, and Michael 1959. They're just about two years, two years apart. It would take so, a few months. So pick up again. Uh, so it's 1959, and you're now an instructor. Yes, and I'd also fit, finish college at more 1955 looking forward to go to graduate school but due to family obligations and thing uh, uh, I became a, what a lot of people call professional students <laughs> taking courses at a AU and you know things of that nature uh, still trying to reach the goal of being a psychiatric social worker I even took special Special what was your major in college at Mohawk? That's psychology and, and education. And I might throw in something else you may not be familiar with. Since you mentioned the Jim Crow situation, the state of Florida, when I first called in Mohawk, my class would have been 51 had not been for the military. Um, 
Florida State at the time, or University of Florida, Florida State, I guess it was in Tallahassee, uh, would not allow me to attend in the field of psych psychology. So what happened was when I went to Morehouse, after leaving the black car, which was Florida and M, the Rattlers, when I got to Morehouse, uh, and I uh, got out of state, you know, it came to problems so someone suggested the state of Florida at that time, and I guess I got it from some of the professors at Morehouse, paid my tuition and expenses to go to Morehouse. Other than you know, well, I'm me. familiar with that. Just <laughs> because, because the state of Florida could not offer. Well, it, it offered that they they said it didn't offer it, but I subsequently found a difference. So that didn't want to, I guess, break things down at that that point in point in time. So they were paying my tuition at uh, at Morehouse to, for the particular major at the time. Okay, so yeah. you graduate, you get a BA in, in 55. And you went on to some graduate studies. Did you complete your graduate studies? No, I didn't. Uh, with Young at the time, I was offered a scholarship at. The, the school of social work. You met late with the young, and I think the name of the school after him. And uh, I did the first, you know, year. And then it came time to, you know, you do the field work and things of that nature. So I was going. To, I found the school that would do casework. So they didn't do casework. Uh, you know, I had YCMAs, YCMAs, and you know, other types of social work. So I started in quite a Western Reserve and, and case case university. So. In Cleveland. Yeah, and there was a possibility that I could get there, but then reading the papers and getting all the plain deal, I think, was the main paper. That job situation wasn't too good with three kids <laughs> and try, trying to go to school at the time. So it, it's never, it sort of, you know, basically failed to, and the possibility of getting a scholarship, which I would still have to work in, in the family, it was, it was pretty rough. So at that time, I really became a professional student. I didn't go. Thanks, because they didn't offer at, at the School of Social Work what I really wanted to get in at, at the time, and they did. Uh, uh, Any GI Bill? I know I used it uh, just very little, actually, for the cause was I had the GI Bill, but I didn't, I didn't use it too much in terms of graduate work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pick up the narrative. You, you okay? So you, you. Well, you, you also were. I still, 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 yeah, I went to Postal Service in 1956. I see. As a clerk, and you still had, still, still had some problems at Jim Road. I think when I went in, we had the, uh, uh, we had still had the separate water fountains and things, and then the restrooms, and the whites who came in together, they disappear someplace, I and mean, we wouldn't see them anymore until we all went regular. You know, you went in a part time, part time, then at the post office, really, it's a career, it's still a career employee. And uh, they come back and uh, immediately had a program where I made regular, it wasn't, you know, part time, and that started very long in, in 1956, and so I spent, uh, it's been a nice career at the post office, uh, basically, I never did go into it. And it had some pretty conditions there, which uh, you, you just, you know, had to ignore it and go about your life in terms of segregation, supervise, promotion to supervise and things. So I guess uh, after a while, they had the separate unions also. I have a six years in there. So I was part of that for a while. and then. And then I got to thinking one day, so I uh, went into the other union, which was, I guess, 98% uh, the, uh, white at the time, and I think I was probably the third black in the, in the, in the so-called union. It didn't make sense to me in my reading, particularly after uh, uh, I went in the union, by the way, but from an academic point of view, uh, to the Jeff Kennedy at the time, he, he said, you know, about this, he felt that uh, government workers in general, he wouldn't do anything to you know harm the welfare and so forth in the United States. So ultimately, we had the executive order 10998. That's that's the basis uh, for limited negotiations for federal employees and postal employees. It came out in 1963. That was one of it. So I got interested in more interested in union activities. In fact, that uh, hey, you don't have to. Strike to get 
meeting of the minds of people. You don't have to strike looking at the history of where they're going. You don't have to strike to get to me. So you have a meeting of the mind. So your social work came kind of came, 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 came 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 hand in there, you know, and then it became really exciting. So I got deep in, involved in it from, you know, from all the way up. And I guess probably I was the first uh, black president of the of local union in Atlanta. What year? Okay, it's 1978. And, and I refused to go to management. Most of the person looked at it and basically I stopped the trend of union presidents going into management. So at no that particular in the union. Huh? And no longer being in the union. Well really basically I think it was a stepping stone. In some instances it wasn't quite some frankly other. But uh, well I guess from my social work background I didn't like the kinds of human relations kinds of activities, you know, were going on at the time and that's said I wouldn't want to be a you know party of of, of certain things and still today I maintain that philosophy. The same as in the in the reserve I understood what was going on and uh, so I took a different role in, in fighting these things, particularly in the, in the military, because it was a it was still a particular situation because I I went about and I didn't I had some hard feeling about it, but uh, uh, Negro officers who were in the ROTCs or whatever they were discouraged from frankly from participating in the reserve period because the little wars had something going on and particularly that was in the officer ranks. So I asked, you know, the, could I become an officer and immediately I said, Well, you'll have to take courses and read and I'm already doing a lot of reading in school and also being a profession. I don't have time, but the regulations said one thing and I wasn't afforded that opportunity in terms of getting promotion and, and so forth in the officer rank. Uh, although I could have also gone to warrant officer, but the counterpart, the person that went with me, uh, things happened that he became a warrant officer and as I said, the rest of the story, Paul Harvey, he really became, you know, well known and he probably went Who was this person? Walter Rucker. This is Mr. Rucker. Yeah, he came in uh, there. was a friend of mine who was in World War II from Florida. Uh, he was had a unit and persons was being given to him, you know, in terms of his staff. And he called me one day and he says, I can appoint one person. Do you know of anybody who would uh, meet? I can make a warrant officer meet. And I said, well, Sergeant Rucker over in the school. He might be there. And so Sergeant Rucker went over, he promoted more than a warrant officer, and he was everything, you know, he looked to be, you know, in terms of efficiency, organization, being able to deal with the Army rules and regulations, which most people said doesn't make sense, you know, things that came as pay and everybody was basically dependent upon him. And, did and Mr. Rucker know that you'd helped his career? Oh, yeah. I did it. You did? I did it twice, really. Okay, tell us about the second time. The second time, as a result of my union activities and of that nature, was, the Labor Department had a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of fun, and they still do it today. And they had uh, funded something to uh, people in Washington who knew me after, you know, going there a lot and working with my particular union, which is post workers. So we have a position in Atlanta that we need somebody from labor to you know, be our representative. And this was getting jobs and so forth. So you might have heard of getting jobs along with the city of Atlanta and the county getting jobs for youth during the summer. The programs they had during, during the summer, we need somebody, you know, they said this is something they had an office out on 10th Street at the time working on it. And they said, would you like to have a job? It was very, very tempting at the time. And after I got into details, but I said, I think uh, Mr. Rucker, who works in the post office here and in the reserve, and me, me, took him. So I talked to Rucker, and this was a real, you know, real challenge to him. And I think he stayed on actually 10 years before he came back to the post office. And in between, he's always been called up for extended periods of apod uh, active duty, even even after he got back to the post office, extended after duty, he could have stayed along because of expertise, personnel type unit. I was instructing personnel also. Eventually, that was my MOS. And uh, that part of, uh, I guess I don't give credit for uh, the Atlanta 
we had to have an MOS and military occupation that involved the, the early stages of computer computerization. And Atlanta Area Tech had, you may call it, antiquated systems. So I was in charge of taking a group of uh, my class soldiers down there so that they can learn it and monitor. And so we set it up and negotiated with there where we could uh, come in on during the night and we'll all be in one class as opposed to splitting them up and I kept the role and kept the order and they had the, the instructors there were doing the doing the teaching at that Atlanta Area Tech at the time. And so we, we got that accomplished. So that also helped me in reserve, although I was eligible for promotions and things. Same thing still goes on in, in, in the current military situation. Uh, yes, I was passed over a number of times in terms of promotion, although I act in certain capacity, command sergeant and major, so I think it went about an eight year span. Yeah, I could have been out a long time ago. I went in with the express purpose of getting uh, 214 or getting rid of my obligation and due to the paperwork situation, it wound up when I got my official commitment where I didn't have to, you know, be in the reserve or anything. If the, Ten years was was gone, so basically I, you know, stayed on. I guess you say fighting a good fight, you know, for other sort of how, in how both in both instances, post office as well as as the, as the, as the military. So how, how when did you uh, retire from the reserves? Officially in 1990. Okay, so you were in there. Yeah, well, what happened after getting after I went to Washington, took a job in Washington as executive vice president, the first in the union in Washington. I can dug with paid slots, not unpaid slots, a summer camp. I still went to, went to camp because the challenges, believe me, are still still there. I did get assigned to some prestigious kinds of group by virtue of having a secret clearance kind of thing. So I was assigned to Washington CID. To, to CID stands for? The Criminal Investigation Division in the Army because of the being in personnel also. And those were pretty good assignments because you stay in a hotel and if you didn't have a car, they come pick you up, you know, to work and these, these kinds of, kinds of things. So you, you, so you, you were uh, investigating? The yeah, the records were... and stuff of people all over, all over the world. And it was a small, small unit, believe it or not, a small unit. And you having a relationship with the CIA and all the other, the FBI, all the other. Tell us your best <laughs> story from that period. Well, yes, I was looking at the records of Martin, uh, an officer in Japan, I think it was, and and uh, they, nobody could really f find anything of you know talking. So going, uh, somebody just happened to come from overseas, and and, and you know they come in for debriefing and so when they come in and see the agent, and they were talking about some activities they didn't have to do it and so forth like that, and somehow they. F through my looking at the record and bringing up to date on the particular officer, he was trying to do something that <clears throat> was the term they used on Wesley Clark the other day, the reason he was reassigned his integrity, some questions about his integrity and where they're doing. So the officers immediately, most of them when they came back, they were actually bused or reassigned to some other place because of the activities that the CID officer there. So that was one, I guess, the, best story of a reserve activity. I was still with the Atlanta U.S. Air Force School in 19, I guess it's the early 60s, we went into Mississippi. University of Southern Mississippi was a campus where we were supposed to stay. And, and I can tell you some other stories behind that. The general was the president of the University of Southern Mississippi. And the general the, was the president of the uni University of Southern Mississippi. That's in Laurel or Hattiesburg? Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg. At the time. And it's a pretty interesting story. Rook and I went in first advance party. And this is 1963. So we went in as advance party. And I had a classmate who lived in taught school and this kind of stuff. So I had called him about coming up. They had this strike going on at, at down at, at the, what they made, was it? It wasn't pork, it was some Bakelite, Bakelite plant at the same time. So I came in, I got a cab. We rode the train and I got a cab and I said, take me out to Elam Arms. Elam Arms was a, a hotel, you know, with football players and it was the most glamorous place on the, on, on the campus and that's where we were going to do our 
camp. So God says, no, he says, no blacks ever lived there. So I'm supposed to live there for three weeks. <laughs> part of the vast part is so when we get to Elam's arm, uh, it says, the camp, so I can't put you off in the front door. I said, I have orders here, you know, to, to stay in this building. He said, somebody may have made a mistake. So I went, they took us around the back of Elam Long, went in, and we finally get a person, one of the students, I think, I just, you know, there. And I said, we're the military, we're just advanced party, so I get things that we're in officer's training school here doing the summer. And I'm one of the assistant uh, instructors to us. And then logistic kind of thing, Mr. Rucker is going to take care of, you know, the paperwork kinds of thing, finance on all your offices. So it went on pretty good because by the time we got there, the civilian technician who were working, you know, they always had, he came in and told everybody it's all right for us to sleep and stay in the, in the building for the for the two weeks. Then the you other, integrated the building? You integrated the hotel? I don't know. what. It, well, it's almost like a hotel, but it's a bit fancy dorms. You know, I guess you see them now. But it was a plush place, you know, the pools, the, the, the recreation rooms and stuff like that. So the offices and job, I didn't know the president of the university negotiated them. At the time, they were really, well, they had 6,000 students there, and you could count the buildings. And I uh, had a little caveat on it that uh, 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 the civil rights leader that integrated the uh, University of Southern Mississippi. You know, he was killed, but when we were going, they were having a protest. <laughs> when it's, that didn't make it easier for us in the summer camp at the so, time. What, what, somebody was killed? Well, they previously had been killed. And they were demonstrating there in, in Hattiesburg at that particular time. We got through that okay, it didn't, it didn't affect us in it, but it was, it was at the time it was, it was going on. So the building, they only had about 6,000 students there. They had those teachers who had either the integrated schools in Mississippi or the non-integrated was able to take classes. So this for my uh, classmate and his wife were taking, she was in music and he was a football coach and track at one of the schools at the time. He was able to take it and he told me the same thing. I don't know, how did you get on the campus here? You know, the stands. And I said, well, had orders from the military. And they all, finally you figured it out, because tennis and some of, most of the senators from the South, in particular now in Georgia in the last few, Mississippi were on their Senate Arms Service Committee. And he figured out economically the state of Mississippi needed jobs and money. So if the National Guard for Georgia was also coming, they weren't staying there. So, so what better opportunity to help your state, and you may call it Pope Bell or whatever, is to have all the reserves from these USCR schools in one state. And stay there for 21 days all, all during this summer. In this sense, it helped the University of Southern Mississippi because they were able to get buildings. I think it started off with the library and the center. You know, they went. Now you can't find your way around. And this, this general, former general, I think he was president all the full 10 years that we were going to Mississippi, and the campus bloomed to, you know, I guess you're aware it got larger, and the University of Hattiesburg got larger than Ole Miss, which was a state state school, and I think that's still true today. So Mississippi to, 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 State got bigger than the University of Georgia? Yeah, and a lot of people know history, and I, I attributed it basically to basically, you know, the military going there, the, 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 the money that were put in, because it just, they utilize, just like convention bureaus figure out how much it's going to mean to a city spending and, and you know, family and so forth. So they, they had somebody ran the numbers, and that also University of Southern Mississippi, which actually stayed in I subsequently saw the peons, I said peons, we moved us out of the Elam Arms, uh, and the reason for the people were so strict on Elam Arms, Elam was a guy in Texas and he was giving the university that building for a dollar a year and his, his, his desires were that you know, blacks really live in there even though the, the, you know, Southern Mississippi may have had integrated football players or whatever, they couldn't stay in that building. But I think the, the Army, they convinced them that, you know, and then the university took the building. I don't know what happened to, you know, the keeping it up against the university took it up. But we eventually moved into the dormitories where students lived after they got some dollars. 
<laughs> had the opportunity to watch Archie Man in there because they were always there at the same time we were playing football. So football players lived in one dorm and the reservists and military lived in another another dorm all, all during the summer. That was, that was another, another, another plus. Let me pick up a, uh, uh, a detail. Uh, just curious about the postal unions. Uh, eventually, I assume it became one union. No. Uh, well, the, the one that still had this, and today you still have one black union. Truly. Yes, and they don't have the necessary. I guess after the after the uh, executive order, in 1964, everybody was represented with the, with postal service, their own. I guess you could say their own interests. So you had six, seven unions there. Uh, the merger where we are today, the American Postal Workers Union, came about as a result of the, taking the trains off the guys that worked on the trains at the time. Mm -hmm. And they did have the individual crafts within the postal service. The Alliance, which was a black union, which I was part of, we had a lot of dual membership, which I was a part of. Explain the dual membership. Dual membership could be a member of both unions. And given the fact, and that's why I went to the other, given the fact that uh, after the executive order, they determined who was going to be the, the, the rep representative of the particular craft, I went to the other union because you basically had no power. Somebody else is going to do that. So I, I went to the other union and kept, still kept membership in, in the alliance. And for historical reasons, uh, it's still remaining today the because they got started out on the rails and they continue today. But, but for the representation, employees, they, they, they can only go in the EEO and maybe some veterans benefit MSPB called Merit Service Protection Board. But we, and I say we, the American Post Records still has to negotiate and all the benefits, they still get the ministry, even though they may not pay dues to our organization, that's, that still exists. They only existed in the largest cities, in the, I guess the 20 largest cities. So we still negotiate for them even to this day, the American Post Workers Union. And they, they have the union, but they can represent when it gets a certain point in the grievance level. They can utilize to the extent the EEO, and that doesn't cover, you know, everyday problems on the workroom floor that you may have disputes and, and arbitration. And they don't have the right to arbitration. I became the, well, I've been an arbitrator not only and for the unions, but also I was, I've been an arbitrator. I was an arbitrator for the Better Business Bureau for here in Atlanta for almost 10 years. Uh, but but specific, oh yeah, particularly not not the volunteer, but now they pay people to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're all, well, most of the I think lawyers are legal aid. I haven't been dropped by this since. Well, we moved from you know from downtown to. To, to, you know, the little lady, I call it little 85, you know, right there now. Mr. Smith was there for about 30 years, I think his son, son has it now. But Mr. Smith? Well, he was Smith to Smith, was the executive director of the, of the Better Business Bureau for, for all Atlanta. So why don't we go ahead and finish up by telling, telling us uh, what you've done since you retired. You said you well, retired I in 1990. Well, I officially retired. Died for, oh, from the military from, from in 1990. Um, I guess I left the assignments that I had, uh, you know, while I was in the military, and even after I retired from the Postal Service in 1986, was even more unique other than CID. I was assigned to what you call the Atlantic Fleet Command. And, uh, explain, explain that. and also Fort Bragg. Atlantic Fleet Command is where. You have all the various branches planning the war. Colin Powell then was the chief of staff. You had to do certain things sort of as if all of the wars were planned. I had planned one in, in Fort Bragg, the bright star in, in, in Europe. That was during the Cold War. And, and with the Atlantic Fleet Command, having some, uh, I guess, social backgrounds and negotiating stuff and with, with the uh, in the, uh, in, in, in the post office and working with unions, you had all branches of service. Now you can imagine now, you know, they always got the friction, you had all branches of service. So what they did at Atlanta Fleet Command, you may have the Army in charge, one someone in the Navy, and you got onto the Marine Corps, and you also, you fill in the 
Coast Guard, so you had the little jealousies between them. And that happened also with the post office. My assignments also wound up in San Francisco. That was the port of embarkation, you know, getting the mail at this time to the guys overseas. In fact, we in the military, we helped with my experience with the post office. We really developed the express, express mail to troops in Europe. That was the first project. With the, you know, the military had the project going on. The the specialty institution, no, the institute was at, at, at in Indianapolis, the post there. That's where you went to learn mail. All branches of service went there. Like every branch of the service, regardless which one. But when I got there, you, when you both, say branch of service, you mean? Navy, Marine okay, Corps. Okay, you're talking about military service, not postal service. Not postal service. All went to there. And when in San Francisco, where they worried about getting the mail to all the troops in the Far East or wherever it may be, you had civilians and all of the military there. And they were distinguished ahead of actual flow. And if you go to San Francisco today, they got a military section with, as well as in Oakland. So you had the, the you had the you had the civilians. You also had all the military. And so you had these little disputes. The <laughs> negotiating kind of you, you again. Yes, he came in. I met him briefly when he came in. Uh, I was up that there when the. Uh, the Russians came. Remember when the Russians came over and brought the whole fleet over? Don't they brought what the, year was this now? I'm trying to think of the year. They were they came over and they turned you might have heard the story, they turned loose all the Russians in and around the the the, the area there, Virginia there. I'm trying oh, to Oh, Norfolk. Norfolk. In Norfolk. They they all came there. They this part of the exchange thing and they had a whole fleet that that come in there and they turned them loose and they were pretty happy. I was there and got a little with things from them, but it was it was quite a quite a day day given that you talk about the traffic here, the traffic in that area, Atlanta maybe not had nothing at the time that that traffic there, you know, coming to Newport News, you know, had to feel Atlanta? Oh, oh yeah. Because they didn't have any any any, any training there. But anyway at North at Atlantic Fleet Command they they the, the, the Colin Powell had to be involved as any else who had the same spot. And when I was at Fort Bragg, the same thing because actually you planned the war before they actually happened. Well, yeah, and uh, we used reservists and troops who actually had to, you know, go in the field. Uh, at Fort Bragg, when they were planning Bright Saw, the, the troopers from, from uh, Kentucky, which was the 101, and 82nd, and you couldn't let those two forces meet on the post. <laughs> <laughs> so we were sort of they were caught in the, in the middle. Maybe we were in garrison, which is being on the post. You know, you know, the, uh, the, the and the 82nd, along with the guys from the, uh, the, the Institute up there. Yeah, so you didn't let those two get together. So the guys from the 101, they would send somebody. They really did come from Kentucky, they just march through the woods. They would march on all the way up there, and then they stop in Pines uh, right, outside of, uh, right outside of Fort Bragg, and then they would, after this all over, then they would go back. <laughs> because that was, that's how it was. But they, the whole point was they were, the kinds of assignments that had involved something that was, you know, really important to the ultimate the defense of the United States. And, and now, see, we got it in a terrorist kind of attack, and so that's the, the but your connection with the military is, is, is you have no more. I have no more now. Other than that, I, I take the opportunity to participate in the uh, Reserve Council in Fort May. We have we have uh, basically quarterly meetings. And what do you, what are these about? Well, I'm on the on the uh, basically a community service uh, committee. They have each, each in the reserve in the council. They have favorites group basically legislation community. Most of it with the colonel, the higher ranking person. We even had uh, uh, um, uh, attorney general, former attorney general uh, Bell. He comes occasionally when it's somebody's getting down where he can't actually get about. But he he occasionally he, Griffin, he, Bell. Griffin Bell. Yeah, yeah. he he's, he comes comes to the meetings at Fort May. And he's, well, well, tell us very briefly, we've only got a few minutes okay. left, but tell us a little bit about your volunteer work in retirement. You mentioned that. Well, uh, during the Maynard Jackson administration, I was, after a fight, to, uh, I was appointed Housing Authority Commissioner. And is that interesting? 
Uh, well, well, it's interesting to point out working in the government and, and uh, one of the vice presidents who was of, of a bank here, an unnamed bank at the time, uh, was, was upset the fact that I was appointed to the Housing Authority Commission. And uh, I said, uh, because of the union affiliation, I guess. And so it was Herman, between Herman Tabbins and our people, they said it was okay. So I, I, I surged in, the, in there, and they, I went on, ironically, I went on a boat when they had a strike. I don't know how long they've been in Atlanta, the housing authority, first time they ever had one. And in fact, uh, I was instrumental in negotiating the settlement of it by staying, you know, hours and hours over the weekend. And we went on to that until I went to Washington, and that's when I resigned and went to Washington. They were having a lot of problem corruption. Then we fired, we're part of that group that fired everybody at the time. Kickbacks and you name it. What year was this now? This is, I was born in 1976, Mayna Jackson, the first, first year in office, Mayna Jackson. I was born in his first term, rather, in office. And so we cleaned the house, so to speak, and that effect. But I've had a lot of volunteers, not only Housing Authority, but ARC. I'm still part of ARC and director. Now, the Atlanta Regional Reading Commission. Commission, yeah. And also, I'm also doing a lot with Fulton County here recently on the task force for, for transportation, the task force for affordable housing, and basically health care. In fact, the, the, we, we're going to have a meeting shortly on affordable housing for seniors after visiting all the housing in there. And now we're finding also that seniors in Fulton County and the city of Atlanta want to stay at home. So what do you do in that case? And it's a lot of issues out there in terms of health care and that, which every, that's part of my everyday life now, basically. So you're working as hard as you used to? And not enough hours in the day. Well, thank you very much for coming to visit us. Do you have any last comments you want to make mm -hmm. about your life or your military service? You've lived in the, you've lived through a very interesting era and uh, something about the leader in this, in, in, in changes that took place. No, I still think that there's something, I guess you get this out of more house, that still some contribution I can make out of it. Hopefully I can live long enough to do it. Well, you look like you look in good physical shape. You look like yes, you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, so I always kidded people about. Uh, I said I want to live long and I work. That's why I retired already. <laughs> <laughs> and when my mother-in-law passed in '93, I said, "Gee, I got to out outlive her." <laughs> well, thank <laughs> you again. Thank you. And